Welcome everyone. As I just mentioned, my name is Charlene Margo, and I'm the co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture that brings you the Parent Education Series. We are very excited to be here tonight with a very special presenter, Dr. Karen Mapp from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I'll be telling you a little bit more about Dr. Mapp, but first of all, I want to say that on a personal note, she is truly our parent education hero. It is her research that we based much of our findings on in terms of the viability and importance of parent involvement, parent engagement. And we wanna thank all of you parents for logging in with us tonight for again, this very special presentation. Um, as you heard, Trini Lara is with us tonight offering simultaneous Spanish interpretation. So if you need Spanish, do click on the globe icon and then Spanish. Tonight's event is generously funded by Mills Peninsula Hospital Foundation and the San Mateo County Office of Education in partnership with this organization, The Parent Venture. It is a webinar format. Those of you are probably very familiar with Zoom by this point. So there's two ways for you, the audience, to engage with us. One is the chat button, so please put comments to us in the chat. My partner, Bev Hartman, will be putting resource links also in the chat. And if you have questions at any time during the presentation, put those in the Q&A button. So comments and resources in the chat, questions in the Q&A. Dr. Mapp will be speaking for about 60 minutes, maybe a little bit less. We really want to hear from you, the audience. So at the end, we will have a parent question and answer period. Again, at the very end, there will be a link in the chat to a very short survey. We hope you will take a minute to fill that out. It helps us with our funders and future parent education planning. <clears throat> Pardon me. Tonight's event is recording and will be available soon on our video library. We partner with the Boys and Girls Club of the Peninsula to produce our videography. So that is always a very special partnership. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's featured presenter. Karen L. Mapp, EdD, is a senior lecturer on education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the faculty director of the Education Policy and Management Master's Program. Over the past 20 years, her research has focused on the cultivation of partnerships among families, community members, and educators that support student achievement and school improvement. Dr. Mapp holds a doctorate and master's of education from Harvard Graduate School of Education and a master's in education from Southern Connecticut State University. She is a founding member of the District Leaders Network on Family and Community Engagement, and she serves on the board of the National Association for Family, School, and Community Engagement. From 2011 to 2013, Dr. Mapp served as a consultant on family and community engagement to the U.S. Department of Education in the Office of Innovation and Improvement. She is also the author and co-author of several articles and books about the role of families and community members, including Beyond the Bake Sale, my favorite article, The Essential Guide to Family School Partnerships, Debunking the Myth of the Hard to Reach Parent, and Embracing a New Normal Towards a More Liberatory Approach to Family Engagement. Please join me in a very warm virtual welcome for our distinguished presenter tonight, Dr. Karen Knapp. Thank you, Dr. Mapp. Thank you so much, Charlene. It's great to be here. And I want to welcome everybody from taking time out of your busy lives to join us tonight for this presentation. And so I am going to share my screen. I apologize in advance. My voice is a little raspy. I've been doing a lot of presentations uh, over this past month. A lot of people are very interested in the topic of family engagement. So I've been quite busy. So uh, the title of this talk is Now More Than Ever, Family Engagement is Essential for Student and School Success. And what I'd like to do, my goals for this session, are really to sort of define family engagement. What do we mean by family engagement? You know, I think that a lot of people have very different definitions. Um, many of them are very similar to one another, but I like to I'll share with you the working definition that I use. Uh, and I like this definition for a number of reasons, which I'll share with you in a moment. I wanna talk about why engaging families is important. What is the reason why we should really be cultivating and sustaining these great partnerships between home and school? And then I wanna talk about this new normal. Some of you may have been hearing this term 
tossed around a lot because I have a lot of educators in particular saying, you know, we don't want to go back to the way things were uh, before the pandemic when it comes to family engagement. We need a new normal. We need a, a new way of looking at or appreciating our families, and we don't want that to go away. So I'm going to talk to you about what I've learned about uh, what we've learned from the pandemic. And also I will talk to you about how I really feel there were two pandemics over the course of the last two years that we learned from. And what do we now need to be thinking about to sustain this new normal, to sustain the kind of partnerships that we should have always had between home and school. So in defining family engagement, I wanna share this definition with you. And the reason why I really like this definition is because it was co-created and you're gonna hear me say that term a couple of times this evening, whether I say co-created, co-designed, co-constructed with families. So this is the definition that the State Department of Education in Connecticut came up with. And the way that they put this together was they worked with families and they didn't just do focus groups with families. They had families as a part of a design thinking type of a process where they sat together with policymakers and practitioners, and they worked on this as a team. And they decided that th these were some of the words that they wanted to make sure were in the definition. So you can see the highlighted words, the bolded words, family engagement is a full, equal, and equitable partnership among families, educators, and community partners to promote children's learning and development from birth through college and career. So let me talk about those three words, this, this phrase, full, equal, and equitable. Full partnership. This is where our schools realize that our families don't just want to be involved in a narrow set of activities. And it actually doesn't make sense to only involve them in a narrow set of activities. Our families know a lot, especially about their children. And so to be engaged in conversations about curriculum, what gets taught, making decisions about resources. You know, some schools are now making sure families are engaged and hiring practices. So it's not, it's what we're saying is don't narrow the scope of how families can be engaged. Think of it as a full partnership and a full scope and range of various roles that families can play. Families are, in some cases, a lot of my educators now realize, and a real untapped and unleveraged resource in terms of the teaching and learning goals that we're trying to achieve for our students. Equal. Families are seen as equal partners, no matter where they come from, no matter what their background is, no matter what language they speak. You know, we all want to be treated as equals. We don't want to have this hierarchy where some families' voices end up being more important than others. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So an equal partnership and one that's also equitable, meaning that we are willing to go the extra mile to make sure that all of our families can participate in whatever way they can. Many of us know, and I'm sure there's people here tonight who can't always get to the school. Maybe folks are working more than one job or they're taking care of uh, family members so that coming to the school at one particular time that's set during the day isn't equitable for everybody. So how can we come up with strategies, come up with initiatives that really are mindful of the fact that we need to make, meet parents where they're at. So that's why I really like this definition because I think it really represents uh, what I'll be talking about later on when I talk about a liberatory family engagement partnership. It really represents that with these words. That's why I like using this definition. And I wanna talk a little bit about why I encourage people to say family engagement instead of parent involvement. So first of all, I'll tell you a quick story. When I was deputy superintendent for family and community engagement in Boston for two years, I actually worked for the district in designing their family and community engagement strategies. Uh, I, I used to try to get out into the community. I actually live in Boston and I tried to get out into the community as much as possible to meet family members. 
And I remember I met um, a woman who was uh, the caretaker for her grandchildren. And she saw me in the supermarket and she came up to me and she said, Dr. Mapp, I have to tell you a story. Uh, I'm not very happy about what happened at my granddaughter's school last week. And I said, what happened? She said, well, I went to a parent-teacher conference. Uh, it was the second time that I had gone. And when the teacher saw me, she said, you know, it's really nice that you're doing this for your granddaughter, but when is the real parent going to show up? Okay, so, uh, you know, very dismissive, not respectful. And so my colleagues and I have thought about, gee, you know, even though it seems like it's just semantics, when we say family, that actually is more inclusive. So if you are using parent, you have to make it clear that you're really talking about all adult caretakers. Because for some people, when they hear the term parent, they only think of biological parent and that's it. They don't really think of parent as representing the whole of the spectrum of adult caretakers that are taking care of our kids, grandma, grandpa, auntie, uncle, cousins, et cetera, right? Now, in terms of the word involvement instead of engagement, you know, involvement sometimes doesn't really connote a real partnership. And when you're involved with something, a lot of times that doesn't really connote a real commitment. So, you know, sometimes I joke about there's a big difference between when you say you're engaged to someone versus if you're just dating and you're involved, right? The engagement really connotes a real commitment. You've made a commitment to this partnership. It's a two-way partnership. Larry Ferlazzo, who actually is an educator in California, he goes even further. You know, he says a school striving for family involvement often leads with its mouth. Right, so it's it's calling the shots. It's identifying the project needs and goals, and then telling families how they can contribute. A school striving for family engagement, however, he says, is really leading with its ears. It's listening to what parents and families think, dream, and worry about. And so the goal of family engagement is not to serve clients, but to gain partners. And I have to tell you, I learned, you know, I, I continue to learn uh, about how to do this work well. And when I was deputy superintendent, I used to actually tell my staff, I want you to, to treat your families like, you know, really special clients, like, like Nordstrom's. And I don't know how many of you have ever shopped at Nordstrom's, but Nordstrom's has a real reputation for really great customer service. So I just wanted my staff to make sure they treated my families, our families with respect. But, you know, I had a couple of family members come up to me and say, you know, Dr. Mark, we don't really want to be clients. That's still a relationship where there's a hierarchy, right? We really want to be seen as full partners. So when we say family engagement, we're really trying to connote that relationship, which is that full, equal, and equitable partnership. So what have we learned about the impact of family engagement? So I often say this is the part of the presentation where uh, I want you to think about, some of you may remember there was a commercial on television years ago, and actually I saw it recently, uh, where uh, an older woman, her name was Clara Peller, and this was a commercial for Wendy's, and she used to yell out, where's the beef? And she wanted to make sure that if she spent her hard-earned dollars on that hamburger, that she was getting, you know, her money's worth. Uh, a lot of times in school systems, we call this return on investment, right? So if I'm gonna do something, what's gonna be the return? And a lot of times I do have to admit, I hear from practitioners, well, you know, you want me to do this one more thing, especially now, you know, we've got all that's going on. Family engagement seems like just one more thing for us to do. But sometimes if we explain what are the benefits, where's the beef around that engagement, people start to think about, well, you know, maybe this is something I should really think about doing because it has benefits for so many. It has benefits for our students, has benefits for our families, benefits for our educators and for our schools. This is the array of benefits that we see when home and school are partnered. These are the impacts on our students, on our kiddos, right? 
We see higher grades and test scores when there's partnership between home and school. These are the students who tend to enroll in those higher level programs, not just in school, but out of school. So any of the programs that might be available for our youngsters to take college credits or any of the programs, summer schools and things like that, because when there's a lot of communication between home and school, our families learn about these different opportunities for the children. These are kids, the little ones, they actually exhibit faster rates of being able to read, of literacy acquisition. Our kids are promoted on time. They have a better graduation rate and they earn more credits. These are also students who adapt better to school and attend more regularly. So I have a lot of schools that keep data on what happens when they start to really engage their families. They start to see their attendance rates go up. The children have a tendency to have better social skills and behavior. You know, a lot of my teachers who make family engagement a priority tell me that because of their relationship with families, the children behave differently in their classrooms. They feel seen and heard by their teachers because the teachers know their families. And then finally, these are kids that graduate and go on to post-secondary opportunities. So these are some of the many things we see when we are partnered between home and school, the benefits for the children. What are the benefits for the families, for many of you? So what happens was, is when you're in this good relationship and this reciprocal relationship between home and school, you know, families have said, you know, we start to change. We start to broaden the way that we think we can be engaged. So remember I talked about that full partnership. If, if our organizations are only allowing our families to be engaged in these small things like coming to a parent-teacher conference or coming to an open house, but nothing else, families end up with a very narrow description of what their job description could be around supporting their children's learning versus places that open it up and really start to engage families on many, many, many different levels. Then families' percep perception of what we call their role construction also expands. What else? Families start to gain confidence. I know through this program that many of you have probably gained a lot more confidence in being engaged in your children's education. We have found that our families also to start to decide that maybe they want to do things for the school. So not just concentrating on their own child, but wanting to be engaged in ways that are going to support and help uh, the whole community of children at that school. And then finally, we also see that families become empowered possibly to start doing things um, to take on new challenges instead in terms of their education and civic participation. So again, this is the impact that we say on these family engagement for our families. Teachers stay at schools that have strong family engagement cultures. This is what we have found out from the research. So this is an enormous return on investment are good teachers when they know that they have families as their partners and there's a school that really embraces and cultivates family engagement, they don't wanna leave those schools. There's often a long waiting list of teachers to get into those schools because they're not going it alone. They feel like they have families as their partners, as their teammates. One high school teacher that I interviewed for a research project told me that you know, teaching is a hard job and having the families with her, she doesn't feel alone. She feels like the families are the wind beneath her wings. That's the expression that she used. So she said, you know, I would, I don't want to leave this high school because I know other schools don't prioritize family engagement. And I, I don't want to be in a place like that. I want to be in a place where we're a community, where there's this wonderful, strong culture of engaging with families and, and valuing families. And then finally, we have research that says that Engaging families is actually a strategy to improve our schools, that without family engagement, our schools actually won't improve. So this was research that was done out of Chicago back in 2010. And what they found was there's actually five ingredients. So I want you to think about a cake because we're actually going to, uh, I'm gonna show you a, a metaphor using a cake. What they discovered was that in order for a school to improve, there's something called five essential supports. So these are five ingredients that have to go into the cake of school improvement 
So we're not just talking about the student improving, we're talking about the school improving. So that rectangle with the triangle inside, that's the classroom. And that's the relationship between the teacher, the student, and the content. But these five circles all impact what happens in that classroom and make that relationship in the classroom thrive. So what are the five ingredients? The first one is the school leadership. So the leadership of the school does matter. But what we found is that one of the characteristics of a good school leader is someone who's not afraid to share power. In other words, share power with families, so share power with their staff, and also share power with their students. Professional capacity that everybody in that building from the custodial staff, the front office staff, Everybody wants to be there and wants to be a part of a professional community, learning from each other. That there has to be a student-centered learning climate. So that's the yellow circle where the people in the building are always asking the question, what's best for the kids? Not what's best for us as the adults. And I have to be honest with you, when I was a deputy superintendent and I would walk through buildings in Boston, my school buildings, I could tell in about 10 minutes, whether that school had adopted a student-centered learning climate or an adult-centered learning climate. I could tell by the way people talked about the families, the kids, and each other, quite frankly. Instructional guidance. This is where the teachers are getting really strong professional development, but look at what's there as number three parent and community ties. This is where family and community engagement is seen as a main essential ingredient to the improvement of schools. So for those of you who bake, uh, what I want you to think about is that all five of those ingredients are really essential to the cake of schools improving. So the authors of this research say, you know, arguing for the significance of one of those circles, right? One of those supports over another is tempting, but we ultimately came to view the five supports as an organized system of elements in dynamic interaction with one another. As such, primary value lies in their integration and mutual reinforcement. In this sense, School development is much like baking a cake. By analogy, you need an appropriate mix of flour, sugar, eggs, oil, baking powder, and flavoring to produce a light, delicious cake. And by the way, my favorite show right now is The Great British Baking Show. And I like that show because I'm really learning a lot about baking. And it's true, if you forget an ingredient, the whole cake or whatever you're making, will fall apart if it's one of those main ingredients. So without sugar or a sweetener, it's gonna be tasteless. Without eggs or baking powder, the cake is gonna be flat and chewy. Marginal changes in a single ingredient, for example, a bit more flour, large versus extra large eggs, may not have noticeable effects. But if one ingredient is absent, it's just not a cake, okay? And I just wanna remind folks that I think that um, Charlene and others are uh, monitoring uh, the chat and also the Q&A. And if you have questions, um, put them in there and I'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Okay, so why has it been so difficult to cultivate and sustain these partnerships? And you know, during the pandemic, uh, I asked teachers and family members a lot of questions about why did they think that it's been so hard to do this? We have all this great research that says that family engagement is so important. Why is there still resistance? And some of my educators did something, did an, educa uh, did an exercise called the five whys. And they, they realized and admitted and were courageous enough to admit that the root cause, the main reason that many of our schools have not engaged our families is because they don't value our families. <laughs> that, you know, for, for whatever reason, that they, they have not really seen families as um, 
valuable partners. And I, I think about why that might be the case. And I think it's because of something that was discussed by a wonderful author. Her name is Isabel Wilkerson. And she wrote a great book. She wrote, her first book was called The Warmth of Other Sons. But she wrote another book recently called Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. And cast is a hierarchy. It's where some people are seen as more valuable than others. And around the world, there are different caste systems. And usually they really are about power, who gets it and who doesn't. So she says, you know, as we go about our daily lives, caste is the wordless usher in a darkened theater, flashlight cast down in the aisles, guiding us to our assigned seats in a performance. So in other words, these caste systems are baked into a lot of the systems and structures here in this country where it's been baked into our policies. And so it makes it kind of hard sometimes for us to break away from them. Sometimes unintentionally, we, we sit down in those assigned seats, right? The hierarchy of caste is not about feelings or morality. It is about power, which groups have it and which do not. It's about resources, which caste is seen as worthy of them and which are not, who gets to acquire them and who does not. It is about respect, authority, and assumptions of competence. Who is accorded these and who is not? And what I find is that in, in my work around family engagement, I see this caste system show up in the way I hear people talk about families. And it could be educators, policymakers, program folks. I hear people say these things. And I think that, you know, again, it's because it's baked into our systems and structures to create these unnecessary hierarchies. And so our families sometimes get stamped with these labels. That they don't care. Uh, you know, Dr. Map, our families don't care. They, they don't show up. Not thinking that maybe the event is scheduled at a time that families can't come, but when families don't show up, I hear, well, it's because they don't care or they don't value education or they can't be counted on to participate. You know, we've tried everything. Uh, they can't understand what we're asking for. And so, you know, we've stopped and, you know, they won't engage no matter what we do. So I call this the don't, can't, won't syndrome. And again, this is how this caste system often shows up in our work around family engagement. So a lot of the practices, systems, and structures are actually set up to treat our families as like those clients, right? And spectators versus full members and co-creators and, and designers. So what do we need to change about all this? What's the way forward? And I mentioned to you at the beginning that I, there were actually two pandemics that we faced over the course of the last two years, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, but also the crisis of systemic racism, which really you know, came to the forefront with uh, the murder of George Floyd and also uh, the other murders that we unfortunately uh, witnessed this past couple of years. But both of these pandemics have actually caused people to sit back and reflect. And they're forcing a, a recalibration uh, a change in, of how we, we, we do family engagement. Some of the things that we learned out of the pandemic is that first of all, relationships matter. Just yesterday, I had a superintendent say to me that when she looks at her schools, and this is a superintendent of a very large school system. She said, you know, when I look at my schools, the schools that had already worked on developing relationships of trust and love, between home and school. During the pandemic, they were able to make whatever pivots they had to make. There was not a lot of drama around those pivots and they're seeing less than expected learning loss in those schools. We also know that educators now realize, many of them, that our families actually know more, understand more and could do more than they were given credit for before the pandemic. A lot of our families you know, really do, first of all, they understand and know a lot about their children. And because educators were basically forced into our living rooms and our dining rooms, uh, they, they had to have conversations with families 
and educators began to learn that, you know, our families really know a lot about their kids and things that we probably should have been asking them all along in terms of their students' strengths and challenges and how they learn. And they were able to be very helpful to us. But again, those were in situations where I think the schools had already established relationships of trust and respect with their families. Now, of course, I'm getting a lot of phone calls from districts all over the world, actually, who want to learn, okay, we're ready now. We understand that family engagement is important, but it, it fit. people have to be trained on how to do this work well. So this is um, Dr. Sonia Santalises. In fact, it was Sonia who said what she said um, to me about noticing that the schools that had built strong relationships with families had an easier time pivoting. But this is from a, a, an Ed Week article that she wrote. And she says, look, people, you know, we have a choice about this crisis. As educators, we can make our new normal, there's that term, better than the old, engaging families as the partners as they are. Or we can wait for families, parents to lose whatever faith in us remains. They cannot unsee what they have witnessed so vividly in their own living rooms. This is another practitioner here in Massachusetts, Nikki Barnes, who says, you know, this past year, our families have become more than partners in our schools. They have become co-authors. So there's that co again, co-authors of our educational journey. This is the new normal, right, for our schools. And I am sure for so many others around the country. So I wrote a, an article with the Carnegie, Carnegie Corporation of New York. New York asked me to write, like, Dr. Mapp, what is this new normal? What should it look like? And so I, I really decided I want to use the words that I think really bring this partnership to, to life. And so I said this new practice of family engagement that I'm really pushing particularly my, my, my practitioners to embrace is one that's liberatory being free of those caste systems, getting rid of those hierarchies, sharing power, solidarity driven, where we work together in union and in fellowship and equity focused. Of course, where our practice around family engagement is fair and just. And so this is the dual capacity building framework for family school partnerships that I uh, authored, uh, co-authored with one of my doctoral students, actually, Ayal Bergman, there was an earlier version of the framework that was produced in 2011. And uh, this was the updated version that I did in 2019. And what happened was that, you know, people said to me, uh, Dr. Mapp, you know, are you going to change this again? Because you need to meet the moment of, of, the, of the pandemics. I thought about it. And I said, you know, I actually think it's the opposite. I think it's that the, the moment is finally meeting the framework because this framework helps to guide our practice. It helps to guide the cultivation of partnerships between home and school. And there are specific processes in here that are identified that people have been resisting. Now they're a little bit open, more open-minded. Now they're a little bit more ready to embrace what we put in the framework. So that's why I said that I think now the moment has actually met the framework and people are more willing to put some of the things that are identified in the framework into place. So this is the whole framework. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing tonight. Um, if you're interested in more information about the framework, you can see there's um, a link and maybe we could put it in the chat www.dualcapacity.org. But I do want to point out a couple of things. Um, it's set up sort of like a logic model. And so the first part identifies the challenge. And so this is what we have found have been some of the challenges around sort of the disconnect between home and school, where first of all, our educators have not been exposed to strong examples of family engagement. They've received minimal training. Most of our educators have not received any training on family engagement. They certainly haven't had a full course on family engagement. Uh, oftentimes when I do conferences with teachers and principals and superintendents and others, I ask them to raise their hand if they had a full course, not just a workshop, 
but a full course on family engagement. And if there's 500 people in the room, maybe five hands will be raised. That's it. Uh, and because I haven't been trained, they don't understand that family engagement is an essential practice of their teaching and learning. And when things don't go right, even the best intentioned start to think, you know, have deficit thoughts about our families and why things aren't working. For a lot of our families, a lot of them have not been exposed to these strong examples of partnership either. And for a lot of our families, we know that they've had negative past experiences with schools. One of my colleagues, Dr. Su Hung, talks about this dynamic called generational disrespect, where families have felt disrespected for generations, and that gets passed down. And that's why I say to practitioners, you can't expect to just call home once or send one invite. You're going to have to really work on building this partnership with your families because they have felt not invited and some have felt downright disrespected by our institutions. So what do we need to do? We have to change the conditions. And that is why I, this, this section here, the purple section, is where we really start to identify what conditions have to change in order for effective partnership to take place? What are some of the processes that we have to put in place as individuals? And then what are some of the things that our organizations have to do? So that's why there's these two buckets of conditions that are the essential conditions. We're saying these have to be in place in order for these full, equal, equitable, liberatory family engagement practices to take hold. So on the process side, these are the pieces that we feel that everyone can put into their practice and the organizational side are the things that we got to push our systems to provide as supports so that we can carry out the process conditions. I just want to touch on uh, one of the process conditions tonight. And that is the, import uh, the importance of building something we call relational trust. And far too often, this is overlooked. People will jump right into the programming part and not really double click on building relationships of trust. And how do we do that? We have to pay attention to building these five core elements of trust. We've got to really focus on building um, respect, showing up in ways that we let people know that we respect them showing that we are competent, that we are treating our families and others as competent people who can, who are great, you know, seeing them as good parents and then making sure that they see us as effective and competent practitioners. Making sure we keep our word and making sure we see people as people and not as objects. Uh, the young man who wrote the article with me and co-authored the framework with me, Ayal Bergman, he asks himself these questions. So he says, you know, for, for respect, am I really listening carefully without bias to what all my families have to say? We all know that we feel respected when we, be, when we feel heard and listened to. Again, am I demonstrating to families that I'm competent, that I'm honoring their role as value and competent caregivers? Do I keep my word with families? And do I show families that I value and care about them? So these are the, some of the things that that I try to, to, when I do professional development, I try to really get our educators to see that you've got to do the trust work first. You can't just say, oh, we're gonna do home visits or we're gonna do you know, this new program. You gotta do the trust work first because the trust serves as the foundation for everything else. Where do we start? Okay, this is where I, I always think that if we're going to start the work, where do we begin? We have to kind of begin by holding up a mirror and examining our own biases because the biases get in the way of building trust with one another. So some of you may be familiar with this term implicit bias. And the definition of implicit bias is the relatively unconscious so sometimes, again, we do it. We get guided by that usher, right? And relatively automatic features of prejudice, judgment, and social behavior. And then also the automatic and, again, unconscious stereotypes that drive people to behave and make decisions 
in certain ways. So again, sometimes we're, we don't even know it's happening, but we are influenced by the air we breathe, by what we watch on television, by what we hear in the news. Beverly Tatum calls this the smog. And this is a picture of LA on a bad day when there's a lot of smog in the air. And she says, you know, we breathe in the smog, not just of racism, but ableism, you know, all the isms, and it does have an effect on us. And so what we have to do is we have to consciously work on it, constantly ask ourselves questions, learn from each other, be willing to take constructive feedback, right? So I often say to folks, you know, you could be well-intentioned, but that's why having these kind of conversations about our biases is a really good thing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to share a video and I want you to hear these practitioners talking about how they've shifted their mindsets around families and family engagement. And um, after that, uh, we'll have an opportunity to um, have a little bit of a chat and a q and A. I I just wanna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for one second because I wanna make sure that I click that little button that says share sound. And I did because if I didn't do that, it wouldn't play for you. So hold on a second. All righty. And um, Charlene, I don't know if you can come on screen for a second because I want you to give me a thumbs up to make sure that the sound can be heard, okay? All right, let me turn it up. You heard Melissa talk about how she changed the way she worked with families, not judging anymore. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I am gonna open up the floor for questions because I really wanted to give us at least 15 minutes to be able to have a conversation. But you know, I will leave you with this. Um, my last comment is I teach a full 13 week course on family and community engagement. And at the beginning of the class, I say to my students and they're gonna go in all different directions in terms of their careers and education. And I tell them, you know, if you're gonna stay in, the, in education, you have to ask yourself, are you gonna be able to love all kids and all families? And I tell them, if you don't think you can do that, I'd rather counsel you out of this field because otherwise you're never gonna be able to do this work well. Uh, that's how seriously I take this piece about relationships and trust and love. So Charlene, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I don't usually get this emotional at parent education events, Dr. Matt, but that was a lot. You know, I started this program, the Parent Education Series, which of course includes parents, caregivers, and grandparents 16 years ago. But my work goes back 35 years to working with families of young children. And that's why we do this is because I learned that those family relationships are everything. And parents are transformational if you can include them and give them the education they need. So thank you, thank you, thank you. It was beautiful. So first question, this is something we always love to ask is distinguished researchers like yourself. How did you find your way to this research topic? Hmm. Well, I'll try to make it a short story because I don't want it to take up the whole time. But basically, I, I used to work in corporate America. When I graduated from, from college, I worked for which was at the time, and I'm definitely dating myself here, the only phone company in the United States. <laughs> Some of you may remember, it was only AT&T, Ma Bell, right? Uh, and I worked in corporate for nine years, knew by year five kind of that it wasn't for me, uh, started to, wow. went back and got my master's degree in counselor education, was thinking about becoming a school counselor, and uh, left the phone company when, and when they had something called divestiture, which I won't go into, but some of you may recall, federal government said, Ma Bell, you're too big, you got to break up into smaller companies. So I left because they offered a package. Um, and lo and behold, I was able to get a job back at my alma mater, Trinity College, working as an admissions counselor. And I got to travel all around the states and meet families like the wonderful families you have here tonight and talk to them about college planning. And when I interviewed the students, I asked the students, you know, why are you successful in school? Tell me what makes for a successful student. 
And every single one of those children told me that their families made a difference. Now, when I went and talked to the school counselors and the principals, and I said, you know, your, your kids are telling me how important their families are. Guess what I heard? The don't, can't, won't. What are you talking about, miss? Our families don't care. They're not engaged. You know, and I said, whoa, something's wrong here. So I went and talked to my mentor and family friend. And he said to me, uh, you, if you really want to do something about this, you're going to have to study it because you, you, you're not a K-12 person. You have no credibility if you don't study it. And so that's when I was lucky enough to get accepted to Harvard. Uh, and it's been my life work since 1992. That is a great story. I love that story. I went to IBM to work in educational software when there wasn't even a word processing program. So I get it. <laughs> More than a decade ago, actually an HR director in one of our high school districts, which shall go unnamed, said to me, Charlene, your program would be the first one cut because you don't directly serve students. And I said, I think there's 20,000 parents who would disagree with you. And I'm sorry that it took a pandemic for some schools to realize that parents and families matter. Mm -hmm. So, okay, here is a great question. Do you have specific strategies for schools to reach out to historically underserved families? Well, actually, the first of all, you know, let's just start with that respect piece, right? And that and that trust, um, you know, because a lot of our historically um, sort of, you know, uh, disadvantaged and marginalized communities, the main problem is that they don't feel uh, a sense of being respected by, by, by institutions, especially by schools. And so the first thing that has to happen is that whatever's appropriate for that community, I know that some, uh, many school systems now use, uh, you know, they do welcoming phone calls home, they've changed their phone call home protocol. So it's not just about calling families with bad news. It's about letting families know how valuable they are. How, you know, I, I never forget, I do a phone call role play in my class and I remember, never forget one young lady who was, who was doing the role play of the educator said to the parent on the other end of the phone, you know, I might be the expert on the curriculum but you're the expert on your child. That's what and we say at every parent ed event. Absolutely. And so those are the kinds of initiatives that you have to start with, whether it's, you know, some kind of a fun gathering in the neighborhood, or it's uh, at least, you know, taking, taking and looking at what we're doing now, phone calls, open houses, parent teacher, making them more welcoming, letting families know we need you, getting that message out there that we need you as a partner. We cannot do it alone. We've told, we've tried to act as if we can, we can do it by ourselves. We can't, it's not possible. We need you, we need your funds of knowledge, what you know about your children. You know, we talk about this concept in teaching of differentiated instruction, right? Where we learn about the child and, and sort of basically customize uh, some instruction around them. Well, where are you gonna get the information from to be able to do that? Exactly. From the parents, right? right. So. Um, you know, and again, when I say parent, I mean all adult caretakers. Mm -hmm. So I would say start with some of those, look at what is already being done now, instead of inventing something new, but say, okay, how can we start this out with a focus on building trust, right? So, and I did write a book called Powerful Partnerships, uh, and that book is actually for educators to try to give them strategies on how to really think about, you know, this liberatory family engagement. I wasn't using those words when I wrote the book, but the practices in that book are in order to get you to that place. All right, and you know, to represent your point, I think this is a lovely question that came in tonight from one of our attendees. She asks, it could be he, I am an immigrant, my school is not welcoming. Where do I begin to connect with the school? The pandemic has magnified whose experience matters and whose doesn't. Well, I would say, you know, the, the thing to do, you know, and I firmly do believe that, you know, we have to take it in small steps, but I would start with your children's teacher 
and let that teacher know that, you know, you really want to be a partner with them and um, ask them for strategies to say, you know, listen, I'd, I'd like to work with you. Um, let me tell you what I know about my child that might be helpful to you. Sometimes starting with, you know, I find that in every school, there's this group of practitioners who actually do want to partner with families, even though unfortunately their school leader doesn't provide them with the supports or the resources. That's why those organizational conditions are also important. But the other thing is work with other families and, you know, that you've got a network here, right here yeah. um, to say, can we work together? Can you give me some ideas? Can you give me some strategies? Uh, ask the school, does they, do they have like, for example, if English isn't your first language, ask the school, do you have someone there who I could speak with in my home language, right? But the other thing is, it's like community resources, other family members, if you can work with them and then, you know, maybe even go to the school to one of their, if they have a PTA or a parent teacher night or some sort of a, you know, a co-decision making uh, body, a school psych council, mm -hmm. you know, go and say, listen, I, I, I and other parents, we really would like to work with you. And so how can we work together to help support our children's learning? So important. We have some really great questions coming in. Again, fairly representative of your points here tonight. Here is one, and I think we are here in Silicon Valley with a huge diverse population mm -hmm. of families, right? The highest of the high and the lowest of the low, and they all go to school together. So this is a good question. What can parents do to help encourage family engagement within a school that is satisfied with family involvement being limited to PTA and lunchroom volunteers? You're gonna to have to speak up and make some noise. You know, um, this is where that, that caste system comes in. That's what I was talking about, right? Where some families' voices get heard and other families' voices don't. And sometimes what happens is that the family's voices who get heard want to keep it that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're not interested in sharing. Um, and so it's a little tricky. Uh, and so sometimes that's where, uh, you know, if you find a particular administrator or a teacher who's interested in opening up, you know, who gets listened to. This is also where, you know, if you have a community organizing group in your area with that you can partner with, that if, if they want to sort of build your muscle mm -hmm. around organizing, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's, you know, I always say, I always start with the honey approach, but if you're not getting listened to, then maybe it's time to, you know, you might have to pour a little vinegar in there uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, you know, I, I haven't seen you know, all of the curriculum that you are uh, exposed to in this wonderful program. But I do think that, you know, you have to think about how do I get my voice heard? How do I organize maybe some other families like me and say, this is not equitable. That's what I mean by, you know, fair and just. We talk about equity. If the school's only listening to a small group of families, that's not equitable. That's really true. And we think about you know, cultural capital, many of our parents we know would like to be more involved, but whether it's work situations, elder care or whatever, they're not able to do, as you said, some of those attend meetings, PTA meetings, evening meetings. So how can we support those families who just may not know where to start approaching a school? Well, this is again, where I feel like the school has to take some ownership and some responsibility <laughs> and meet families where they are. So I'll give you an example in Iowa, uh, in a rural community that um, I went to visit, uh, they realized that their families can't come to the school for meetings because mm -hmm. they're working in the meatpacking plants mm -hmm. or working in agriculture. And so what they did was they worked with the companies and they do a lot of their events at the meatpacking plants. Yes. Um, or they organize to do things uh, in a local library. Mm -hmm. or they organize to do things in a park, or they use technology. So they'll do Zoom meetings. They send out you know, information to parents to say, what's a great time for you to do a half hour Zoom meeting? Mm 
Mm-hmm. You know, we'll do it at times that are convenient for you. That's one of the things that's really been a blessing uh, as a result of the pandemic, because I think people are using texting and, and Zoom and things like that. It doesn't have to be that people have to physically come to the school. That's kind of outdated mode as far as I'm concerned. Use the technology. There's a lot of different applications that are out there now that can be used to engage families. So in that article, um, and thank you for putting it in the chat, Bev, um, embracing a no normal, there's examples of six not-for-profits that are doing wonderful work using technology to engage families. So it's no excuse when I, you know, when schools say, oh, we can't reach families, that's malarkey because if we ask families the best way to communicate with them, and again, we've got Zoom, we've got texting, we've got all sorts of, you know, class dojo and all these other things. Um, and if we can, you know, have a have a night where we do a training on Zoom for families, uh, how to use the portal. You know, a lot of places have these portals, but they don't take the time to show families how to use them. Yeah. So let's do a Zoom where we could show families how to, we create a video. Where we show families, make sure we translate it, you know? So it takes some creativity, but it can be done. Exactly. For example, we've always offered Spanish interpretation simultaneous for 16 years, but now we're also doing Spanish language programming so that people can listen in their native language. And those are up on the video library. We have a whole band in Spanish that's making a difference. Some of those things are pretty easy to do. All right, here's a question I would love to hear your answer to Dr. Mapp. How do we convince administrators to give the time to their staff to learn about the importance of family engagement? They only wanna spend time on academics and yet if families are not engaged in the academics, they will not be as successful. Well, I think sharing, you know, some of the research or having families explain and talk about how important this partnership is to their children's learning. Um, first of all, what I try to impress upon educators is that family engagement is not a program. It's a practice. And I have that quote in the article from the Carnegie from my friend and colleague, Michelle Brooks. Family engagement is a part of teaching and learning. It's not separate. It's not separate. Right. Right. So whenever you think about whatever your teaching and learning goals are, family engagement is a strategy to get there. Your families are, are this wonderful leveraging energy source to help you get to where we want to go. And if you share it with families, what our kids need to know and be able to do our goals, and you know, you share tips and tools on how to get there. Now you've got this whole bundle of people helping to support that child hitting those marks. So, you know, people, I think the problem is, is when people see family engagement as a separate exercise from teaching and learning and instruction. Yeah. It's not, yeah. it's a part of teaching and learning and instruction. And that's why I tell educators all the time, you, you know, you've separated it out. And I tell them, I ask them, why, why do you engage families? Sometimes they look around. <laughs> You know, well, well, we do it out of compliance. Mm. And I say, wrong answer. Wrong answer. You engage your families so that your children that you have with you can be successful and that you can be a team and work together to the success of the children. I said, so no more of this seeing family engagement from separate from your, your goals, whether they're social, emotional, you know, academic goals, well-being goals. That's a strategy to get you there. You don't just do it. We talk about random acts of family engagement. You don't just do family engagement for no reason. It's all about, it's a part of schooling. Absolutely. And you know, that's what I learned. That was the lesson I learned that brought me to this work is if you really know the families, you're going to do better by the kids. We knew the kids well enough that if I saw a sock on the ground, I knew whose kid it was right? We did home visits. Those things all made a big difference. We had potluck dinners of families from all over the world. I remember, and it's been 35 years. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, let's see. And this it makes your life easier as an educator. That's yes. the thing. It makes, your, it makes your job more enjoyable as an yes. educator. When you're working with families, it's more fun. You know, your families, you know, support you and you support them. It just, it's, I've been in schools where family engagement is really um, in their DNA 
And those schools are just even enjoyable to go just sit in because you see families coming in and out. There's all this great conversation. People trust each other. It's not, doesn't feel like, you know, this rigid place. Right. So flipping just a little bit in the few minutes we have left together, parents of children with disabilities or special needs often find themselves in adversarial relationships with schools. Do you have any advice for how schools could better support disability awareness and inclusion? Well, you know, I did my research um, for my dissertation at a full inclusion school. The Patrick, it was called the O'Hearn School at the time. Now it's the uh, Bill Henderson School. And one of the things that Bill Henderson, the school leader would say was, you know, we, we, do, we do inclusion big I here. Now, what did he mean by that? He said, we're gonna take the principles of inclusion and we're gonna extend them to everything in the school in terms of including all of our families in conversations about their kids, including, you know, including all the staff, including the custodian when we do work around family engagement. Yeah. Yeah. And he said that that's what we need to do. We need to take the, the practices and the policies of inclusion and in, extend them to create an inclusive environment. Inclusion isn't just about rules and policies. It's about a culture and an environment. So I learned a lot about, you know, when we say inclusion, what does that really mean? Um, you know, he made sure that inclusion meant that there were no separate classrooms. So, you know, that's, that's what inclusion is supposed to mean, right? And so it's really an attitude and a belief about what it means to see and include all children and all families, um, regardless of what their circumstances are around ableism or whatever. All those things are wrapped up in seeing people as whole people. So, you know, I, I just think that we have to practice what we, pe we preach when we say, you know, inclusion. W what does that really mean? Is it just this big little eye inclusion or big eye inclusion? Yeah, that is beautiful. So Dr. Mapp, we've had so many positive comments in the chat and people are so grateful to you for this discussion tonight. Do you have any final parting words for us? Well, keep up the wonderful work that you all are doing because I know that um, through your work, families feel seen and heard. And I think that, you know, a lot of times, unfortunately, it is difficult uh, if they're dealing with a, an institution that, that doesn't see them and hear them. But I would say come together, um, you know, use your collaborations as families to come together to try to push for change. Uh, change takes time. You know, last night I was on a call with some superintendents and we admitted that, you know, schools, because they're bureaucracies, they're not really built for change. <laughs> you know, they're, they're built to sort of stay, you know, stay the same. You know, we've been, you know, you know, you hear that expression. That's the way we've always done it. Right. Um, but but now is the time. You know, that's the title of my talk. Let's leverage what we've learned during the pandemic about the importance of family engagement. So Let's true. Slide back. So true. Um, I used to tell schools that, you know, I would tell parents that schools are like elephants. We have really good memories, but we move really slow. <laughs> it's true. Absolutely true. So thank you so much, Dr. Karen Mapp, for a brilliant discussion tonight. And thank you, everyone who's been on with us. Really wonderful. I know you're going to want to share this video and watch it again. So again, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mapp. That was a wonderful evening. Take care, everybody. And we hope to see you again soon. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody.